so it's 4.31, so I think we can all get started. Um, well, thanks everyone for coming. This, I believe, is our second hybrid meeting, so we have a couple people at the BSA space, as well as others on Zoom. Uh, and I highly encourage you moving forward to collaborate and meet in the BSA space. I know a couple of our board members were hoping to be there today, but unfortunately we couldn't make it. But I guess that is the benefit of having hybrid meetings. So that way we can't miss out on the awesome content that Julie and Luke are about to present. So kind of talking about uh, our presentation today, I would like to introduce everyone to Julia and Luke from RDH, both of which I had the pleasure of working with them on multiple projects. So I can say from personal experience, they are both very knowledgeable in their field. And today we are going to be having a presentation about uh, building science and the fundamentals. So a little bit about this topic and I'll leave it up to them to get more into it. But an overall view is that they're going to be talking about the functional approach to the enclosure design uh, and also go into explaining the enclosure control, the function of the different layers, but then also going over some rules of thumb for this perfect wall approach. Uh, and a couple of other um, things before we get started is that if you have any questions, uh, Luke or Julia, do you prefer if they type it in the chat or if they uh, just kind of interrupt your presentation? Um, other, uh, yeah, feel free to interrupt uh, when it makes sense. And also, I think uh, Luke is monitoring, other Luke is monitoring the chat. So um, he can he can take care of uh, any any questions that are in there as well. So. Yeah, I'll just flag you down at the right time. Perfect. Put something in the chat. There we go. Um, okay, perfect. Yeah, so we had kind of, uh, I can get started if you want. Uh, yep. And then, well, I guess one more second before you start, Luke. Um, Susan is going to post in the chat, which is a link to a uh, Google form. So that way mm -hmm. you can add your AAA number. So that way you can get CE credit. I will also be copying and pasting that uh, text at the end of the presentation in case for those who miss it, but needless to say, it will be in the chat. Uh, and without, I guess without further ado, Luke, the floor is all yours. Okay. Um, thanks everybody for joining both in person and in uh, hybrid form. Um, I guess I kind of missed the missed the memo about it being hybrid. Otherwise, it would have included my uh, insurance salesman photo um, at the start of the presentation, so you could see what I look like. Um, so today, I'm I'm joined with my colleague Julia. I believe most of you are familiar with Julia. She's uh, been on or working with the backboard for a little bit of time now. So um, anyway, she's gonna co-present with me today, and I like. Like Sarah had said, we're going to be going over Building Science 101 or the Building Science Fundamentals. So just brief disclaimer, you don't have to read it. Um, and a shameless plug about RDH. So who are we? Um, our, our mission statement is we make buildings better through the integration of science, design, and construction expertise. We have, sorry, I just gotta minimize this window so I can actually read off my presentation. Um, so we are a, we have about 300 staff currently in nine offices across North America. Our primary focus as a company is the building is a building enclosure first, um, and that's that's where we started, and that's kind of where we where we hang our hats. So currently our offices are here. Uh, Julie and I both work in the Boston office. Uh, yeah. So the so building science 101, or building science fundamentals. So today, uh, the learning object objectives for today are um, to explain the key functions of the building enclosure, uh, apply the perfect wall approach, identify types, functions, and typical materials of the building enclosure, describe how to create continuity between building enclosure and control, control layers, and to describe and identify thermal bridges within the building enclosure. So, the building enclosure is an environmental separator. And what do we mean, what do I say, when I say building enclosure, what do I mean? Well, what the building enclosure 
as we define it and as most people will define it, is your basement floor, your foundation walls, above grade opaque wall assemblies, windows and doors, and then your roof systems. So the way we try to approach understanding the building enclosure is looking at it not only from the materiality, but what the function of each of those materials plays within the building enclosure. So when we take a functional approach to the building enclosure, it helps us solve problems and also to increase the performance of that particular assembly. The functional approach to building enclosure design, basically the enclosure separates the interior from the exterior environment. This includes all the assemblies that make up the building. Again, the roof, the walls, the windows, uh, from the innermost layer to the outermost. And also, at, on occasion, we do have interior separations that we have to deal with. Say you put a pool or you have a rink in your house or you've got a warehouse where you have it unconditioned for the most part, but then you are also looking to keep office space in a corner of that warehouse um, conditioned and comfortable for occupants. I see we have a chat message. Is that just the link? This is the AIA um, credits. If you're watching virtually, um, go to the chat. You want to put in your numbers. Uh, credits. So here we have a section cut of a typical single family home. And so when we look at the function of the building enclosure, what it's trying to do, say in the wintertime here in New England, we want to keep our interior temperature you know, around the 70s in, those, in the wintertime. The relative humidity is probably closer to 25%, and our vapor pre pressure is about 195 inches of mercury. My house, personally, I'm cheap. So it's usually 67 or 65 interior temperature, but we, will, we won't, we won't uh, sweat the details today. And so on the exterior, um, we're dealing with a temperature that's usually you know, 23 on a cold day, Relative humidity is sometimes in the 40s outside, depending on whether it's it's snowing um, or what. Uh, that I'm just looking at the slide, and that relative humidity actually seems high. But anyway, here we go. So, what forces are we trying? What forces are we trying to overcome here? So, the warm air wants to move to the cold. The moisture, the vapor pressure wants to push vapor outside of the building to the exterior environment. So we want to keep that warm air inside. We spend all of our money to heat it. And we want to keep that, we want to keep the vapor pressure, we want to control how it moves through the envelope or whether it moves at all and whether it has an opportunity to condense within that wall assembly. So as I mentioned, condensation can occur on wall within a wall assembly if the dew point temperature reaches below, or if the temperature of that particular surface reaches below the dew point temperature. So if we flip it around in the summer, we're wanting to keep that hot air from inside of our building, or from entering the interior of our building, and we want to keep that cold conditioned air that we um, spent all that money on, we want to keep it inside. So we have an inward vapor drive here in the summertime, and we run the potential of also having condensation. Probably not in New England. This is more like a Florida situation um, where you're probably going to have inward vapor drive and the potential for condensation to occur in the summer when people crank their AC way down. So the functions of the enclosure are basically to manage these forces across the, across the envelope of the building. So, we have a hut here uh, on a beach somewhere. Um, I didn't take this picture, one of my colleagues did, uh, somewhere, I believe it was in Haiti, but I can't be 100% sure, I don't know. Um, so, is this particular building enclosure waterproof? If we're looking at it just empirically, do the people inside stay warm or do they stay, and, and or warm and dry? The answer is probably not necessarily warm, but it's in tropical area, so, or sorry, probably not necessarily dry all the time. Probably not, they're probably not too cold because it's in a tropical area, it's probably fairly warm. 
but that building probably does leak a little bit, but it's got a bunch of airflow, so it's, it's really serving the purpose that we're looking for. So building enclosures back in the day, um, you know, look something like this. And pretty simple, it, the wall, the structure does the same, performs all the functions. That structure is also waterproof, air quotes, airtight, air quotes. And now today we're dealing with something that's a little bit more complex. So as we've learned over the years, we've slowly seen building enclosure construction evolve and increasingly become more complex. So today what we're hoping to do is look at a way to simplify the way we think it or the, uh, simplify our approach to design so that we stay out of trouble with the increasing complexities that we have. So we'll talk about a few more um, elements of the enclosure and then we'll get into the design and the, the, the crux or the, the, the meat of the presentation. But first we, wanna, we thought it was important to go over how our buildings get wet. So one way is precipitation. Rains outside, falls on the exterior. If your if your exterior wall is not uh, if it's not clad, if it's just a barrier system, that can lead to moisture accumulation within your wall assembly. We have vapor and air drive, or sorry, we have vapor movement and air movement. Um, air movement can is a probably an or, or air movement within a wall assembly carries with it water vapor, which then in the appropriate environmental conditions can become uh, condensation when it comes into contact with the surface that is below the dew point temperature. Construction moisture. Um, when we build, we've all been on job sites or seen pictures of job sites. There are usually puddles everywhere, and that moisture is sometimes dried out before we close it all up, or sometimes it stays there. In the case of concrete, it can take a significant amount of time for the water, that, that free water within the water cement matrix to leave that particular substrate. And then also groundwater. Um, so if we live in an area where we have a high water table, that can cause us cause problems. We can also just have drain or surface water that is seeping down into the soil that can also add moisture to our building. And then we think about it from the other perspective, how do buildings dry? Well, evaporation is one. Air and vapor movement is another one. So you know, if, something, if something can get wet from vapor, it can also dry via vapor diffusion. And drainage. So we can drain our wall assemblies, think rain screen. And then also ventilation. Um, all of those elements help the building to dry after it has gotten wet. And the real thing, the, the real point behind all of this is that building enclosures and building materials in the construction environment can get wet. There is a safe storage capacity for most materials. And so it's really about figuring out and striking that balance between the wetting mechanisms and the drying mechanism so that we don't get ourselves into a situation where we have breakdown of those particular building materials. All right. And with that, it's all about balance, similar to this hut here on the beach. Okay. Julia, take it away. Okay. I have my camera on. You can see me here also in person. Thank you all for coming. Um, now that Luke has talked a little bit about the science behind the building science, I want to go into start talking about those control layers within our walls, the perfect wall in our opinion, and then um, maintaining continuity of those control layers, identifying thermal bridges, and when to look, where to look for those control layers in your architectural detail in your drawing reviews. Um, Got to give credit where it's due. These are some of our references. So let's get into the perfect wall. So we've got four enclosure control layers. We've got air, moisture, thermal, and vapor. 
Okay, so here is a diagrammatic view of um, a wall section, and we've got a few different layers here. This is our perfect wall. We've got your exterior finish or cladding, um, that is the water shedding surface. You've got, and then your external continuous insulation, as well as your external continuous um, control layers for air, vapor, and water. And then you have your structure, port structure behind everything, and of course your interior finishes. You can click through. So those control layers in the perfect wall scenario are outboard of the structure and continuous. And the cladding, like I said, is water shedding and or drained, like a rain screen. Your insulation is going to be moisture tolerant, and it can either be adhered or pinned. The structure is going to be kept warm and dry because it's on the interior of those control layers. Um, we, don't ha we don't see any services or conduits penetrating through those layers, creating a discontinuity. And then the interior air should not be condensing on the structure or on the studs um, or the backside of the sheathing because we have our management layers, control layers. So this is so we see this perfect wall, and you're like, okay, I've seen other versions of walls, um, and they work. So what's so perfect about this wall? So up here we're going to have three different wall scenarios. Um, we have wall one, two, and three. The first wall shows you what um, a section with just insulation continuous on the outside, on the exterior of the um, control layers, and on the exterior of the studs. Wall two has um, continuous insulation with the addition of a bat or so infill. And wall three just has bats within the studs. So the, the point of this slide is to show the effects of where your insulation happens on the wall or within the wall on the surface temperature of those particular of the different materials within the wall assembly so when we have all of our insulation on the exterior of the wall that basically we're allowing interior heat to keep the inside of or the back side of the sheathing warmer but we're also preventing the exterior limiting the effects of exterior temperatures on the structure itself. So when we add insulation to the wall cavity, what actually happens is a little bit counterintuitive. Um, you know, you think, oh, I added more insulation, things should improve. But when in fact, what actually happens is we buffer the interior heat that we get from adding, or from the previous wall assembly, wall assembly one, we buffer that and then we actually will drop the surface temperature of the exterior sheathing, which in turn can become a condensation risk. And then if you go over to wall three and you eliminate the exterior insulation, you're, all, you're eliminating that buffer from the exterior to the interior, and you're basically what's happening is the thermal bridge associated with that, um, with those steel studs is dropping the the exterior temperature, or sorry, the temperature of the exterior insulation and creating a high risk for steel studs. And I know there's probably some of you looking at these photos and saying, hey, um, I've done a couple of these before. And there's no hard and fast rule that says these wall assemblies won't work. Chances are you've managed it um, in some way, shape, or form with a smart vapor retarder or um, additional exterior insulation, that sort of thing. And the takeaway is that the perfect wall will work in every situation. And when you deviate from that, it's always a good idea to do your due diligence and check. So um, that's when you call somebody like RDH or SGH or somebody to, to take a look at your wall assembly and help you understand whether or not your, uh, whether or not your particular assembly under the right environmental conditions in here in Boston will uh, will be an issue from a condensation risk perspective. Okay, so now that we've talked about the perfect wall, we want to connect um, our enclosure and talk about roofs and slabs. So take your vertical wall, now you have a slab, turn it on its side. And you can also turn it upside down to get a roof. So. 
here's a section cut of a um, slab detail. You can see um, if you tilt it back up, you have the same similar elements as your perfect wall. The earth acts as your, or the earth and the stones or um, drainage mat can act as your water shedding surface. You have your control layers, continuous exterior of your structure, which would be the slab. And then if we look at the roof, we have your roof structure with the control layers above it. And then you have your cladding or ballast or filter fabric um, exterior of all of that. Except no ballast in Boston. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so how are we gonna maintain continuity of these control layers and why is that important? So we have this diagrammatic view um, of your roof, your wall, and your slab, and there's um, at each corner of the building, you're going to have your roof, wall, and slab interface with each other, and those details are where we have the most um, difficulty maintaining that continuity. So, for example, you have your footing detail and your parapet detail, and you can see where those control layers come into each other from each building component. And I know what everybody is thinking. Wow, that's easy. Um, <laughs> And it looks that way in practice, but as soon as you get into how is that parapet supported structurally, um, how do we actually make that transition from the horizontal to the vertical, that's when it becomes more complicated. For sure. So, a zoomed out view, we've kind of got all these critical junctures, and then you also see that there are transitions from a wall, like our wall assembly goes from both above and below grade. There's also transitions there that need to be thought through. Okay, let's talk about thermal bridges. So any structure that's going to go through your building envelope and devalues your insulation is what we're going to call a thermal bridge. Um, get into looking at a few of them. Here's a plan section on a building corner. You can see the red arrows kind of show you um, the thermal bridging occurring through the structural studs. Here's a section um, at some curtain wall. You can see the, um, again, thermal bridging through the red arrows um, that occurs. Okay. So here's another one. We have a, a section through a brick wall and windowsill. You can ignore that the air seal is at the back of the curtain wall. Please don't look at that. <laughs> but for, for the sake of the presentation, um, so that we're going to be looking at the alignment of that curtain wall um, within the wall. So in the left-hand view, the curtain wall is aligned with the brick. And as you can see, the, the your curtain wall um, thermal control layer is in the IGU. And then in your wall assembly, the thermal control layer is in your um, insulation. In this case, it is um, the yellow. Or let's say it's rock wall, for argument's sake. Um, your thermal control layers are not aligned in this in the left-hand scenario. And so you have that red arrow showing that thermal bridge. On the right-hand side, you can see if you align your IGU with the insulation, your thermal control line is maintained in one plane. Another thing to point out um, in these examples is the wood blocking on the left-hand side is a lot thicker, um, and that can also add to the thermal bridging. And then on the right-hand side, um, it's replaced with some plywood that has just less area. So for the people in the room, is there any opportunity to further improve the performance of this? Mr. Prespo. <laughs> yeah, we could do that. We could also potentially, given that it's a steel stud wall, I mean, we may be able to get away with anchoring directly to that and not even needing plywood at that particular location. Yeah. Exactly. I'm going to interrupt yeah. really quickly, but we can't hear what um, the other person is saying. Do you mind moving the microphone so we can hear the conversation? I'll see what I can do. Brad, just yell. <laughs> yeah. So, Brad, the first thing the first thing he said was to modify the materiality of the plywood. Is that that was the first one, right? Yeah. Um, so switch it to something that is even less thermally conductive than wood, 
And then the other option that we had presented was to just get rid of it altogether if the structure allows and then modify your anchorage details of your curtain wall um, to keep that inside of your uh, inside of your air seal. Okay, so some rules of thumb. Um, we're going to aim to use that perfect wall approach every time. However, um, you can't always get what you want. Um, so there are some other options. Um, keeping, and this is also very controversial, but um, general rule of thumb, you can keep your vapor control layer on the warm side of the installation to stop that vapor from reaching the cold surface. You can um, have all your insulation ex on the exterior of the steel studs, or if you want to split your insulation, aka put some of that insulation in um, in the studs and on the exterior, um, then you can do some calculations and risk assessment. And then a third option, um, again, for that split insulation, you can stick with the rule about using two-thirds of the R value on the exterior continuous and then one-third of the R value in the studs. But again, we always recommend that you do some assessment. Um, I will say uh, my apologies for the uh, the extra U's in there. Um, yeah. Every once in a while, we give presentations north of the border, and sometimes you just don't get to scrub all of the U's out of there. Um, I will also say that, um, that for the warm side of the wall, I will. I don't think that's controversial necessarily. I would say <laughs> that it's 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 the case. Um, there may be a situation where somebody may argue that with you, but if you run a hydrothermal model, it's pretty evident that you want to control it on the warm side of the wall. Less a controversial, more of a hot topic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, construction drawings. How does this translate to reality? Um, so, the uh, here is a rendering of a building in Mississauga, Ontario. Bonus points if everybody, if anybody knows where that is. If you've flown into Toronto's Pearson Airport. You have been there, so <laughs> now you know. Um, so some of the things that we, when I personally go through a drawing review, um, I will, you know, take out the take out the isometric or the rendering of the building and kind of just do a general overview of it. And what I'm looking for is the orientation of that particular building, uh, north, south, east, west, how that plays into effect from a um, you know, a shading perspective, solar heat gain, et cetera, et cetera, whether or not, you know, we can say, hey, you could probably go without that overhang on the exterior door, um, or whether we're going to say, no, you absolutely need it. Uh, looking at kind of, looking at the window wall ratio, the height, shape, box, uh, looking at partic particular areas that I may think, hey, this is gonna be a tricky detail to maintain air barrier continuity. Uh, and or continuity of, of various control layers, and then kind of visualize in my mind where I would have expected an architect to cut sections for me to, to review. And similar situation with the floor plans, like I'll, I'll look over, kind of identify each of the, each of the call outs um, for your plan details, look for sections again, and trying to identify those areas that I would think would be difficult. Um, Another thing to look for, especially on like a ground floor situation, if you have a mixed use building is does this, or if you have a loading dock or um, a gymnasium, anything that's going to get a separate air or a separate conditioning um, regimen, you want to look for potential environmental separations that you would, you would be looking to do. Um, here in Boston, we always put parking garages under buildings in downtown. So that, that's the number one spot that we take a look at to say, hey, this is where this is where our air barrier actually needs to go and this is where our thermal insulation layer needs to go so that floor that's above that parking structure entrance is not cold when you're walking on it in your bare feet because, <laughs> I mean, we all walk around the office in bare feet. <laughs> um, similar situation here, I'll, again, I'll look over the drawings identify you know whether or not I can see each individual window type um, whether I'm I'm clear on what opaque wall assembly what the assembly is uh, and again looking for those particular difficult particularly difficult details uh, and transitions and so we, once you get into the, the section cuts here it's a similar situation I'm 
you know, all of these details have been identified. I'm looking at um, each individual uh, call out to see if they're clearly, what, if each assembly has been clearly identified. And then I'll go to the assemblies page and kind of scrutinize every, every assembly here and understand um, what function each of these particular elements is playing within the uh, assembly details. So again, you're looking for your control layer placement, you're looking for what those materials are, you're looking for your air barrier, whether it's fully supported or not, uh, thermal bridging for the cladding anchors, and if, you know, if we're lucky, sometimes we get to see um, R values that have been clearly, R values that are on the drawings. Um, it's something that we're seeing more and more, um, and I think it's a real, it's really good to kind of get that clarity um, and understand what, you know, if you look at it from a code perspective, if you say it's R10 on the exterior wall, um, as soon as you put continuous Zeger rails on there that are made of metal, it's not R10. Um, so like sometimes having that visual representation of what it is, if you were to interpret it from the code perspective, or if you were to actually model it thermally and see what the actual R value would be, the clear field R value then. But. So just to elaborate on the uh, nominal versus uh, clear field. Clear field, right, or respective mm -hmm. R value. Uh, what would, uh, for, for the practice in architecture, what would you recommend Show on drawings to illustrate. Repeat the question. So, uh, Brad's question is, what will we recommend to show on the drawings, uh, whether it be the nominal R value or the clear field R value? We typically would say what I mean. My, and again, I'm not an, not an architect, but what I would say is whatever you're trying to um, demonstrate code compliance with, I would put that in there. We go, like, if we're involved on a project fairly early on, we'll pull together an assemblies matrix and we'll include both. And then whatever one is going to be scrutinized by the code official, if, um, I, I mean, if you're going from a modeled compliance pathway, I would put Clearfield in there because that's what you've used in your model. Um, so, does that answer the question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's an interesting point. Yeah. No, that's okay. Yes, you definitely can. <laughs> so, sometimes less is more and sometimes it's not. So, if we just kind of zoom in on one of these particular assemblies, this is a precast uh, concrete cladding system. So in this particular assembly, they've got a continuous air vapor barrier on there. So thinking uh, blue skin uh, or your, a metal clad. I don't know why Henry names are only coming to mind, but it's Henry, you owe me. <laughs> uh, and then we have a ther our thermal insulation layer as well. Um, and then on top of that, you also have your water shedding surface. So one of the things I think is important to note is that your water shedding surface does not need to be continuous, and we'll go into that a little bit further, because I mean, understanding that you do need to also ventilate um, or drain uh, your drainage cavity if you have a rain screen system. So again, for the roof, uh, our air, and I'll point this out and be very explicit, the air control layer for a roof is on top of your structure. It is not your roof membrane. It is the air and vapor barrier that has been installed on the structure, over top of the structure of your roof. Uh, thermal insulation layer, and again, uh, water shedding surface. That's why sometimes you hear people refer to the um, vapor retarder as the temp roof, because it is acting as that roof membrane. Okay. And so what we do as building enclosure consultants is uh, we're not, you know, we're not uh, extremely high-tech people. We, uh, the way we demonstrate continuity is through the pencil test. 
Um, so the idea being is that you should be able to trace a line, especially for your air barrier. You should be able to trace a line through an entire section of a building and or a detail of a building uh, and not lift your pencil off the page. So here um, you can see there actually is a break in this uh, particular box that we have drawn. And I think that what's represented there is that it's unclear how that air barrier continuity may or may not be, uh, may or may not be uh, achieved. There we go, that's the word. So if we're looking at that detail in particular, we want to identify our air vapor control layers, our water shedding, and also our thermal insulation. And I'm not sure if I drew another one. And so if we look at the underside of the slab, we can clearly see that we have our air vapor barrier underneath the slab, as well as insulation. And it's worth noting that the two red lines don't connect. So in practice, they may not connect, but we all often do also make assumptions in the world that we live in. And so we have a cast in place concrete foundation wall. Um, there's pretty good chance that it is continuous, relatively airtight aside from the cracks that we get um, down the road. But, you know, for all intents and purposes at this point, we're maintaining that air barrier continuity across that concrete by adhering our air barrier to both sides of it. So the other thing to look at in this particular detail is here are, you know, looking at potential thermal bridges. So we have the anchorage um, for the precast elements. Those are uh, thermal bridges across our enclosure. Um, flashings can sometimes, flashings can also be a, uh, a thermal bridge as well. Um, anytime we're using a cementitious material, we try to, we, we always push for stainless steel because A, stainless steel is, um, stainless steel is not only durable, but it actually is not nearly as conductive as, say, an aluminum flashing. Then you can kind of get, like, next level and go to the passive house versions of it where you actually break the sheet metal into two pieces and bridge that with a self-adhered membrane. Um, so, it, there's various ways to deal with those particular items. So again, looking at some window details, again, you want to identify your control layers. So here we're drawing that line vertically all the way through um, from the face of the cast-in-place concrete, uh, or sorry, the precast, is it? No, or from the wall structure, it's not really defined in this detail, the wall structure down um, through the this is a louver de or through the window detail um, into the window head down through the IGU into the sill and then down the rest of the wall assembly and again our thermal barriers are here but if we're looking at this again scrutinizing it a little bit more we'll also want to pick up on those thermal bridges and so where we lose our insulation depth and that yeah, which is where the precast returns into the into the building enclosure. We're going to lose that depth of insulation, and then we're going to uh, have the additional conductivity of our um, of our window frame at that location as well. All right, so everybody's favorite the parapet detail. Brad is shaking his head already. <laughs> so. Um, again, we want to tr we'll, tr we'll trace that air vapor barrier, and we'll want to. Uh, it goes basically up the wall, up and over the parapet, and then down, um, and, uh, down to the roof structure level. Um, so thermal thermal insulation layer. I mean, we can all see it as clear as day. We're kind of lacking a thermal continuity as we get to the top of the parapet wall. Um, not only that, but the way that that parapet wall is framed, we allow kind of a chimney effect to bring warm air up inside of this to then hit this 
perfectly cold sealing so that it can then run down the backside of our sheathing and back into our building. So, um, in summary, how are we doing time? Not too bad. Um, in summary, typically want to identify environmental separators. Uh, we want those elements are, that are inside the enclosure and those that are outside the enclosure. We want to look at our buildings for any special use cases like pools, labs, our archival spaces, gymnasiums, hockey rinks, uh, et cetera, et cetera, because those may have environmental or those may have special environmental considerations for that require an interior separator. We want to strive for the perfect wall. It's the best, in our opinion, it's the best way to start. Uh, start off with your wall assembly because it is uh, no matter where you put it if you put it in Florida or if you put it in Massachusetts or uh, it call it none of it it will work um, and then you want to draw continuous lines to illustrate your air control moisture control and thermal control layers and finally we want to identify and mitigate our thermal bridges within our wall assembly all right, discussion, questions? Luke, uh, your pair. I'm just curious, what, uh, what strategies do you prefer there? What's your favorite thing to do? Uh, my favorite thing to do is to provide, in this particular location here, I would just prefer to cut this off. So whether that is blocking it and then providing an insulation here and tying my air barrier across, that's my preferred method. Um, in practice, that can sometimes be quite difficult, um, especially given you know how the building is built from a structural perspective. One of the other things that I actually think gets overlooked a lot within our industry is the fact that between, uh, especially with a metal deck roof, um, air will travel between those flutes and the substrate board. So when you go to the other parapet detail here and you're basic you're inviting air to potentially so let me see if I can actually move this. So in this in this particular instance here, this is actually I manipulated it. This is actually platform framed. So, you know, you could just run your air barrier across here and then you would probably be okay. Yeah, I I'd be cool with it. But one of the things to think about is that in 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 the other section you have the these flutes will be running into your parapet wall and if you don't continue your air vapor barrier across that you have gaps in your sheathing so technically you could have air migrating from the interior space through those flutes and up into your parapet wall i mean it's probably pretty low risk but that i've had uh, I had an instance in uh, North Dakota in the middle of winter where we had icicles hanging from uh, <laughs> hanging from our, our ceiling because of that. So it it can happen. Was it a normal building or was it like a pool? It was it was a, so it was a data center and it was a it was a deconstructed air handling unit where the whole first floor would basically it had like an intake room or aisle. Then it had an evaporator room, it had a, a, con a condensing room, and then a heating cooling room, and then exhaust. And so, you know, we also had elevator pressures within those particular rooms, but in the wintertime, it was enough to force that air up and then bypass all of our environmental separators and shoot out to the perimeters and then icicles. Not that I have a, a question, but a comment on your parapet detail. Um, I was on a project in St. John in the Virgin Islands, and they did not have a continuous or, you know, they had a um, CMU parapet that just went all the, all the way up. And I was like, wait, that's not right, because it goes against everything that you're talking about. But different conditions where they don't have winters and it's 70 degrees all year where they don't necessarily have to worry about that condition or you know they do just in a different regard not as extreme temperatures on either side of the wall but that was just a red flag looking at all these details because it's dramatically different than what we designed to up here in the northeast where we have winters yeah I mean you have to think about condensation you have 
think about condensation in the reverse order, right? Where you get, if you allow, if you don't put a vapor retarder on the exterior side of the wall in that, in or on the warm side of the wall to drive home my point from earlier, um, then you run the risk of having condensation occur on interior surfaces, drywall in your, um, in your air conditioned hospital in the Virgin Islands. Right. It's kind of like the opposite of our design here. Same concepts, just different application. Yeah. Don't put wallpaper now on the yeah. wall either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I did have another question going back to slide 33, where you had um, the insulation located, I guess, on different components of the wall. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'll uh, so get there. Right here. There, yep, 32. Yeah, that one. Um, so it's not so much a question, but more like hypothetically speaking in different scenarios. For instance, if you were going to, keeping it simple, design a shed that you occasionally want to work in in the winter, would you go with wall number one? Just because. If I was. If it was it's at not my house performance building that you're worried about, but in that case, you're more worried about condensation rather than your heating bill. Yeah, I mean, I would think, are you, so if the shed that you, I mean, it all depends on how you're conditioning that shed. Like if you're going to, if you're going to condition it year round, then I would, it's different than if you just go in there and like your car hearts and freeze your butt off for like the, the evening. <laughs> right. Do you know what I mean? So if I mean if you're going to condition it year round, I mean you'd want to insulate it. Um it's New England. Um and you're pro I mean, is this a personal shed? Because if you're dealing with steel studs, I probably <laughs> shed. If it was like if no, not steel like studs. a wood shed in the backyard that I'm gonna wood frame, I'm probably doing assembly number three and I'm doing a vapor open. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm you know, tie back wrap. Like <laughs> I'm not spending the money. <laughs> How hypothetical is this shed really, Sarah? Well, I was trying to yeah. come up with an example that's like simple and everyone can envision a shed. <laughs> You're just like, I work from home enough now that I'm going to build a 10 by 10 in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, exactly. your presentation is really great for this application that I'm going to do. So, um, Fair enough. but I guess my other hypothetical wall assembly would be, you know, like a CMU res hall that's going to be, um, you know, like revamped. To, so you have this really thick exterior wall. Do you, I know that it's kind of back and forth and depending on, you know, existing conditions, but do you add insulation to the exterior? Do you add insulation to the interior? And it kind of, you know, aligns with your three different wall assemblies and which one that would match up with and why it would be better for, I guess, a number of reasons. Like, you know, so you don't- I'm a big, Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of uh, drained eaves in uh, over top of like a CMU application. Um, you know, put a new, put an air barrier on the outside of that vapor impermeable, then throw some insulation on the exterior. I know everybody's like worried about eaves, but if it's done right, it can be successful. So that's, I mean, that, that's probably the retrofit strategy that we're going to employ probably throughout New England on buildings that we don't care what they look like. Um, yeah, I mean, would be, eaves, that would be how I would. Eaves is fine for masonry, you just, don't typically want to put it on metal stud, right? Or are you even sort of sometimes okay with that? Yeah, I think you can do it. It's, it's, it's all the right application. I think the other thing to note is that, you know, there are like seabirds are a pain in the butt with eaves and, you know, the, the eaves can be, the eaves if done right and reinforced properly, it can be okay. But I've seen spot, I've seen, especially like some of the new mineral wool eaves, I've seen, instances where you have like a bird that has built a nest because they pecked their way through it and now they've got this like comfy little mineral wool <laughs> cavity to hang out in. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, is, I think if done properly, again, <laughs> if done properly and drained, I think I think you can definitely put it over top of steel studs. So is, is 
not to put you on the spot here, but is has uh, based on like new sort of details and and you know system uh, options and whatnot has you know the Canadian insurance companies reverse their uh, position of not insuring that or or is that still a thing? I don't know. I don't. Pra I, I I know that there's some Canadianisms in the uh, in the slideshow. I definitely uh, I I don't. Pra it's been it's been a long time since I've been home. It's been ten years since I left. But uh, so I can't answer about Canadian insurance companies. But I think at, I think an insurance company, if it's signed off on or you know approved by engineers and there's you know documents in the file to say it's okay. I think they I think you're probably going to be able to get some concessions. Um, yeah, fair, fair I think, enough. Or, but I mean, the reason we had so, so many issues back in back in the 90s with EAPS is that we didn't drain it and we had right. water that got trapped in it. And if there, was a, if there was an air barrier or some sort of weather resistant barrier on the wall at that time, that, you know, it, it was not vapor impermeable and you ended up with just a mass of moisture sitting against plywood or whatever that particular sheathing was and just driving inwards when the environmental conditions were right and keeping getting that sheathing wet. And then, I mean, we've all seen it or hopefully everybody's seen it because it's good to get scared <laughs> um, <laughs> where you can just put your finger, where you can just like put your finger or push your hand through a wall assembly because the, or you open it, pull the insulation out from the interior, and you just like see this plywood just disintegrating behind the eaves, like or, it, or even the metal good... stud where the front and back of the metal stud just separate. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 All so. right. Well, fair enough. I mean, so basically, as long as it's draining and drying, in principle, it could be a viable solution, even for metal stud. Yeah. It, I mean, the new eaves products that are out there are intended to drain and so i think that yep. they can be if deployed in an appropriate manner and designed properly and installed properly tons of caveats you can tell them an engineer <laughs> um then i think it could <laughs> yeah okay which goes Appreciate back it. to what you were saying earlier about that water shedding layer doesn't have to be completely continuous um with yeah with eaves i would make it as continuous as possible and yeah. then drain at, at the base of the wall or at through or out through all Sorry, you look like you have a question. <laughs> um, at the uh, the base of the wall, at the foundation, you had the detail with the uh, air barriers coming together or, or not quite coming together. At the yes. Concrete. Um, and, uh, just earlier today, we were looking at a detail pretty much exactly like this in my office, trying to figure out how to bring these together and um, couldn't quite see it. Um, in our case, we've got CMU mm -hmm. coming up from the footing okay. of the concrete. So you know, if, if this detail is relying on the concrete to kind of complete the air barrier, is CMU going to perform that same role? Or? In theory, if it's fully grouted, yeah. yes. Um, I would probably, and I mean, the... Yeah, it, and then you put an air barrier on the outside of it. I mean, you're pretty much airtight at that point. Um, but again, this detail applies for like, this is a vapor retarder. If you're going to have like a situation where you might have hydrostatic head and you're at your, you have waterproofing, you're going to want to go around this particular uh, underneath and try and get, you're probably going to go right around the underside of the footing. Like, I mean, you want to keep that connected because you're going to end up with where that vapor Richard. retarder meets Can the wall me? sample, the foundation. Yes. This is Richard. Um, uh, this would be a good application for use of uh, um, <clears throat> cellular glass block because it's a thermal break. You could li line, it would line up with the insulation in the, under the slab. You still have to deal I with an air barrier. Uh, yeah, Richard, I've I've seen that I've seen it proposed in a couple in a couple projects now, but I've never seen it actually installed because it gets VE'd. Is it is it getting cheaper yet? Um, I don't know, but it's this perfect. It's the perfect solution. <laughs> yeah, I, and it be I mentioned agree. as being, you know, if you can ever get it, that's the way. To, that is a way to solve. There's no other way I know of 
if you've got block to solve the thermal problem yeah. and in mm -hmm. concrete with the, with your the base design here with precast you're stuck you just have a thermal bridge that you you know you know there's no way you can get around it you could put your insulation mm -hmm. on the inside of the block but then you don't you know your block is cold and it's uh well you could consider that but um I mean, the inside of the precast. And you could consider putting on the inside of the block. That would be uh, the only other way I would think of handling the thermal bridge. But uh, the more better way is to put the gla use glass block. So I'll, the other I'll application. Shut up now. <laughs> no, it was, Thank you, it was, Yeah, we appreciate it. Um, the, I mean, you could just bring, if you were concerned about the air tightness of the block, you could also bring the air depending on how deep your foundation wall is, bring it, bring them both down to the footing because that footing is going to be cast in place, right? True. Yeah. Or you could run the air barrier on the inside of the wall, up and around, yeah. up, take the red line up and over the top at the window and down. That's fairly simple, but the thermal one is the hard one with these, with these materials. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Richard. Anybody else? point on the east discussion not yes. to go down the rabbit hole. No, I, 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 I will you love this know, rabbit hole. It's my favorite one. <laughs> no, I, I, heard you, so I don't think this is not the case in Boston now, but um, uh, certainly probably most of you probably are in so New York City. They have uh, different city laws, city codes, obviously in New York, but I, I've heard that lately due to the new code, I think it just came into fruition like one year ago, like your standard meat and potatoes eaves system is now like very difficult to do down in New York City for fire cookers. Yeah. Not for not what we're talking about here, but so that's not the case in Boston now or Cambridge or whatever that, but it's curious. Yeah. That and may I, occur here. Uh, I mean, we. You know, highly populated, you know, densely populated. Here. Yeah. Did y'all hear that? Sarah, did you hear that? Uh, I did. I heard bits and pieces, but basically in New York, they're having issues with East because of fire code. Because yeah. of more stringent fire code. Yeah. yeah, I think. And so I actually just recently put East on a building in New York, um, but it was the mineral wool version of it okay, yeah. for that very reason. But like at the same time, like the reason we all like East is because, you know, it's it's an extruded, extruded polystyrene that is like good R value per inch right. and then all of a sudden you and make it really cheap. yeah and then all of a sudden you make it mineral wool then it it and it you get that hit so your your sweater becomes thicker yeah you know you're you're wearing a puffy jacket instead of you know some some sort of like right. wool jet sweater right. <laughs> I don't know yeah <laughs> no, not a fashion I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah and technically it's still wool but <laughs> <laughs> so well, yeah. One has omni heat, and then the other one doesn't. <laughs> there we go. See, I'm not a I'm not a fashion guru. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other? I'm just looking at the chat. Well, sort to okay. sort of to, to jump off Richard's question. I mean, obviously, when you're talking about like a full perimeter, you know, footing foundation wall, um, that's that's one thing. But if you just have like structural steel columns coming down into like a slab on grade situation, um, like 12 or 13 years ago, I did a project where we use like solid phenolic blocks as like thermal bridging under these massive steel columns. Um, is that is that still like sort of a viable solution um, for for thermal performance, thermal bridging under underneath columns? Or is there a, a better way to do that now? I think it all depends on the capacity that you need. Um, yeah, this was only like a five star building. Say, yeah. yeah, but the first thing I would say is why? Like <laughs> that would be, I'd be like, do we have to have this column exterior? Okay, can we just put, can we bring it interior or can we wrap well, the column so it, it all the way down? It actually it. was an interior column. And and part of my uh, sort of conversation at the time, you know, with my, with my architect hat on back then was, you know, this is a, you know, uh, basically it was, it was a building that was, it was built into the side of a hill. So on the uphill side, you know, it was totally underground, but then, uh, it opened out, you know, at grade, uh, elsewhere. 
And I just, I wasn't totally convinced, you know, with, you know, frost penetrating at 45 degrees or whatever, that we really needed such an expensive solution um, for what was essentially already underground. Do um, you have any thoughts on that? I mean, as you describe it, it's hard to, I mean, I'm not, I'm a very visual person, but as you describe, as you described it, I would say, um, depending on the depth below the surface, like I think the, the effects of exterior temperature on ground temperature, I think it, it beyond six feet is, is very, uh, it starts to diminish quite a bit and you reach ambient temperature, which is of ground, of the ground, which is around 10 degrees C. I mean, that, that's just me making a bunch of inferences, but. I yeah, yeah, but that. I guess sort of the well. basic question is like, do you need to thermally break like at the bottom of a, you know, heavy structural steel column to, you know, insulate the interior space from just like the ambient ground temperature? Um, or is that, you know, not necessarily that critical directly underneath? I mean, obviously you can have sub-slab insulation, but at those column locations, you know, is that is that something that we typically see as critical? Or is the ambient ground temperature not that much of a concern in those select areas yeah. that, you know, it's okay? I think it would have to depend on how far away from, like if it's within the center of the building. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. You know, it's probably not as big of a concern, but maybe exterior columns like that are, you know, within six to 10 feet of the exterior wall. Sure. Maybe you, and it's, it, it's slab on grade at that point, then maybe for sure. But um, I mean, I would, at that point, it's like you've got, you might as well just insulate, like if you have sub slab insulation, you might as well just come down the sides of that, that column and that footing. Gotcha. And then just don't go under. Then just, I mean, that, that would be my, I would be, I mean, again, you can look at it all you want, but at the end of the day, it still needs to be built. Sure. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? No. Doesn't right. look like it. Well, thank you, Luke and Julia, for a great presentation. I definitely got a lot out of it. Um, also, in a couple of weeks, this presentation will be posted on the BSA website. So feel free to share with others, especially those who are looking to get more of a general understanding and the basic concepts uh, of design. I know that I will definitely be sharing this with a few of my interns who I think will benefit greatly from understanding the basics and you guys um, explained it very well. So thanks again. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you guys for giving us some of your Monday afternoon. Thanks guys. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot guys. Great presentation. All right. All right. And then with that, everyone have much. a great night. Those at the BSA space, I'm jealous I'm not with you to enjoy beer and pizza. <laughs> Man, they have pizza too. Me. I know, we're all missing out, guys. <laughs> but yeah. next time, have a great hey. evening, everyone. Thank you for coming again. Uh, I'm having some fun. So. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing?